bonjour à, à tous. Donc, mon nom est Thierry Bader, je suis directeur du Centre de recherche en données et intelligence géospatiale. Et euh, nous accueillons aujourd'hui euh, John Lindsay, qui est professeur au département de géographie, d'environnement et de géomatique de l'Université de Guelph. Euh, C'est un grand, grand plaisir d'avoir John aujourd'hui avec, euh, <rire> avec nous. Donc, euh, je suis ravi aussi de voir qu'il y a plein de monde d'autres universités, hein, de l'INRS, de des, des UQ et autres. Là, donc, a priori, un webinaire très populaire. Et pour ceux qui euh, voudraient le revoir ou n'auraient pas pu y assister, euh, la vidéo sera mise en ligne après, euh, après la tenue du, du webinaire. Donc, euh, John va présenter pendant... 30-40 minutes, on va dire, et puis après, il y aura une période de questions. Donc, je vous demanderai donc, pendant la période de présentation de fermer euh, vos micros euh, pour ne pas, pas déranger euh, notre, notre invité. Et puis, donc, vous aurez l'occasion bah, d'intervenir, de, de, poser des questions, échanger avec, euh, avec John. Donc, soit vous pourrez le faire euh, en direct en ouvrant votre caméra, votre micro, soit vous pourrez poser les questions dans le chat. Et puis, à ce moment-là, Charles et moi, nous <rire> nous occuperons de relayer vos, vos questions. So, uh, John, thank you again for, <laughs> for your presentation today uh, with us. It's a real pleasure to have you. So uh, now uh, the, the ice is yours. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, again, as way of apologies, um, I haven't I haven't studied French unfortunately since high school, and so my French at this point unfortunately is uh, basic numbers, days of the week, colors, and that's about it. So apologies uh, for those of you who um, uh, English is is maybe not as familiar. Um, For the title of my presentation, in all honesty, this one uh, was what I wrote down when, when requested for a title. But in truth, um, what I've provided here is, is really kind of a comprehensive overview of, of what it is that I research with emphasis on, on more recent um, and a survey of some of the, the past research items as well. <clears throat> so in terms of my research area, um, I'm always someone who kind of struggles in describing exactly what it is that I do. Uh, but in fact, there is, a, there is a pretty solid focus in terms of the many strands of my research area. And I'd say that my focus is on certainly geomatics and specifically geomorphometry. Geomorphometry being the discipline that's primarily focused on the quantitative analysis of surface topography, usually by analyzing digital elevation models, DEMs. And in terms of the three major strands of what my research focuses on, I'd say the first one is, is um, one that perhaps people best know me for, and, and that's the focus on, on uh, open source geomatic software development. I've been involved in creating several uh, open source ge geomatics uh, software packages that people have used for their own various research. And for me, the purpose of doing that has always been uh, really about creating a platform in order to test and to disseminate the advances in my geomorphometry focused research. So. My second area of research has really been about, about uh, developing uh, pre-processing methods specifically geared towards uh, fine resolution LiDAR DEMs in order effectively to better uh, improve the preparation of those DEMs for applications largely in environmental modeling. And then lastly, the strand, last strand of research that I'd like to talk about today is <clears throat> related to the second, and that is in the development of um, Uh, parameters, geomorpho geomorphometric parameters, uh, and specifically here I'm talking about novel DEM-based land surface parameters or LSPs. I'm going to be talking about LSPs a fair bit throughout today's presentation and just know that these are essentially <clears throat> indices that can be extracted from digital elevation models. Uh, slope, aspect, and curvature are common examples of LSPs. And so these are the three areas that I've spent a fair bit of my time over the past 20 plus years Uh, working towards. Oops. So to begin with, I'll look at some of the um, research that I've focused on in terms of the development of open source geomatic software. For me, the development of open source software has always been about the fact that, in my opinion, as academics, we have a, a real responsibility to ensure that when we develop novel techniques in the field of geomatics, that those techniques are then accessible to practitioners. Now, I often see that um, it's the case that, you know, uh, academics develop wonderful techniques and then publish those techniques in journal articles 
where they then, um, you know, unfortunately go to die as no one, no one's able to actually use it in practice. And so um, I've always viewed the development of geomatic software as being a way for me to disseminate the research that, that I carry out, particularly in the field of geomorphometry, um, uh, as, a, as a way of being able to uh, apply this in practice. And uh, again, I see that as sort of the responsibility of the academic working in this area. The idea here is effectively to get the novel methods that I develop. And again, I would, would describe myself really as being a technical scientist. My focus is on development of, of novel methods um, rather than say an application scientist. And uh, the idea here, as I say, is to get these novel methods in the hands of as many people as I possibly can. And I've been doing this for, as I say, going on 20 years now. So going back to my PhD, the very first thing that I ever programmed was in fact a, a GIS, and that was the terrain analysis system, which came out of my research in, um, in my PhD from 2001, and I continued to develop it even going into my early career from to about 2008. Um, the terrain analysis system was essentially a, a basic GIS. Uh, it initially began as, as I say, the platform for me to embed the novel techniques that I was developing at the time for my PhD in a format that other people, particularly those in my research group at the University of Western Ontario could actually use. And um, as I showed the people in my research group, hey, it does this and this, they would always ask, oh, can you add this and this? And eventually that thing ballooned to quite a large scale that was encompassing of, of all sorts of uh, capabilities. Um, the train analysis system was at the time because of the way that I designed it, it just sort of added things on here and there, pretty limited in its in its um, uh, extent in terms of what what how I could further develop it. And eventually I hit a wall. And uh, as a result, um, in 2008, I uh, started or rather 2009, I started to develop uh, a new GIS from scratch should say that the reason that I've always been developing my own platforms is back in 2001, the open source GIS community was very different than it is now. The landscape didn't include as many open source GIS that, that we see today. And so at the time, it kind of made sense to develop your own platform, whereas today, obviously, much less so. But my second stab at this was to create what um, I refer to as white box geospatial analysis tools or white box GAT. And this was a Java program that I developed from 2009 to 2017. And again, it was a full blown GIS with a user interface that allowed you to interact with um, several hundred tools that were available within, within this package. It was a very successful GIS, plenty of people used it, but um, particularly towards the end of its development, the thing that I had come to realize was that most people were actually using other open source GIS, particularly QGIS. And when they came to Whitebox, it was with the perspective of it had a set of unique tools that allowed it, allowed people to, to analyze their data the way that they wanted, but they preferred to do so in the environment that they felt most comfortable doing so in, say, QGIS. So I was frequently asked whether or not you could remove the tools from Whitebox and have them embedded in other in other platforms. And unfortunately, because of the way that it was designed, that was actually quite difficult to do. And that led me in 2017 to develop Whitebox Tools, which despite its name is actually quite different than Whitebox GAD. Whitebox Tools is a platform, a standalone platform for advanced geospatial analysis. It does not have its own inherent user interface. Instead, it's designed to be embedded in other um, other um, forms like, for example, QGIS. Um, as I say, I developed it starting in 2017 and I did so under a very permissive um, open source license, the MIT license. It is a complete rewrite from um, Whitebox GAT. And I developed it in a, a very modern systems programming language referred to as Rust. Um, and the source code is available on GitHub if you're interested in that. As I say, it's designed to be embedded. Um, so for example, it's embedded in, in uh, different scripting languages. There's an interface for it, an application programming interface for Python and R, and in fact, NIM as well. Um, you can download Whitebox tools. As I say, it's a standalone executable. You go to the web page provided here, then uh, you can just download this and, and install it on your machine and it will be accessible from different environments. Uh, it's also accessible from different front ends. So we have currently a front end for QGIS and one for ArcGIS. 
Um, and these are the forms in which many people obviously interact with, with white box tools. We're pretty pleased with the extent to which this project has taken off. So for example, um, uh, a recent survey sh uh, shown that, that um, we've had over 220,000 installs in the last two years uh, in at least 166 countries and territories. And in fact, it's probably more than that. Um, that uh, survey of 166 uh, countries that came from an analysis of about 10,000 downloads of the software which is just a small fraction of it. So it's pretty widely used. And the reason that people are using it, of course, is because it offers a great deal of strength for geospatial analysis with over 525 tools currently available. And that strength reflects effectively my interests in geomatics, because again, I view it as a platform for disseminating my own research. So as I say, the, the um, focus of analysis is certainly on, uh, you know, geomorphometric analysis, so DEM pre-processing methods and analysis methods, spatial hydrology and stream network analysis, uh, LIDAR analysis and remote sensing are all strengths of white box tools. So if I can now focus instead on the platform for disseminating my research more on the research itself, to begin with, as I say, I'll look at LIDAR DEM pre-processing techniques. Over the years, I've developed a number of methods to help applied researchers better utilize the LiDAR DM data that over the last 20 years has become fairly ubiquitous within our field as the gold standard for modeling topography. LiDAR data, of course, provide, as we all know, a great many benefits for all kinds of applications. In particular, again, from my background, um, it's very widely used these days in spatial hydrology, but as well in many other fields like soils mapping and forestry. And the reason that it's so widely applied is largely down to the fact that LiDAR data are fairly unique in the offering of very fine resolution um, and uh, accurate maps of topography, particularly uh, under, under vegetation cover. So while there are other similar um, uh, terrain mapping technologies that can provide very fine resolution, they often are confounded by, by the uh, presence of, of forest cover in particular, whereas uh, LiDAR data has the ability to see beneath that forest cover, which is fairly unique. And while these data provide all sorts of very wonderful opportunities for research and for applied modeling, um, the fact is that they come with certainly very unique challenges as a result of these characteristics as well. So these challenges are usually the result of the fact that they, again, have very fine spatial resolution and therefore represent elements of the topography that are perhaps not uh, within, contained within coarser resolution DEM data, and also the very large volumes of data that LiDAR uh, offer. So with that fine resolution, of course, comes the responsibility of handling much larger data volumes. And that means essentially that the techniques that we've used in the past for processing DEM data often don't apply to, to or translate as well to LiDAR data. And so ultimately, I come to this from the perspective that we often need better tools for being able to cope with the challenges of working with LiDAR DEM data. And specifically, the things that I've focused on, and, and we'll talk about here at least briefly today, are uh, the challenges that are presented by the fact that oftentimes LiDAR data contain many millions of very small artifact and real topographic depressions. Uh, and that can make surface flow path modeling really quite difficult. Uh, secondly, LiDAR data, because of their fine resolution, also often contain a fair amount of, of um, surface roughness. And that surface roughness can confound the, the uh, geomorphometric characterization of the, of the topography. And specifically here, I'm talking again about the extraction of land surface parameters or LSPs like slope, aspect, and curvature. Uh, this is a very challenging thing to do on a very rough surface, which LiDAR data frequently is. And then lastly, the fine resolution uh, means, of course, that they're representing topographic uh, features at a very small scale, and that also includes anthropogenic features like, say, road embankments and rail embankments. And this, for certain applications, can actually be quite problematic, something that we didn't have to contend with when we were working with 30-meter DEMs, but do now that we have you know, sub-meter LiDAR DEMs. And here, applications like, for example, soils mapping, um, it may not be obvious, but when you have a road embankment in a LiDAR DEM and your interest is in soil mapping, well, of course, that, that embankment wasn't there at the time that the soils were actually developed. 
And so what we're interested in creating is not so much a present day topographic surface, but rather a topographic surface that's more representative of the past when those soils were actually formed. So to begin with topographic depressions, uh, again, LIDAR data, this is sort of essentially what I studied as part of my PhD and has been a thread throughout my research program uh, over, the, over the years. But LIDAR data contain a great many depressions in them, often literally millions of them. And this is owing to the fact that their fine resolution and high accuracy allows us to actually capture micro scale topography or, or small scale topography. And the reality is outside of highly engineered urban landscapes, natural landscapes or even agricultural landscapes, topographic depressions do occur. Uh, they are natural features. The, the, uh, topographic variation at a small scale is such that, that there are plenty of topographic depressions out there. But these features are very problematic for, for uh, particularly spatial hydrology and they need to be removed. There are generally two approaches in the literature that have been used to, to remove topographic depressions. And those include techniques for filling depressions and techniques for breaching through depressions. Uh, I've probably written about six or seven papers um, that have suggested alternatives or improved methods for doing this uh, that, that are well suited to application to LIDAR DMs. But I'm probably most proud of a recent series of publications that are focused on, instead of um, uh, depression filling, depression breaching approaches, and in particular, least cost breaching approaches. Uh, I've long advocated the, the use of breaching as an alternative to filling for removal of depressions in LIDAR DMs. And that's because they frequently result in a much lower impact to the DEM with respect to altering uh, elevations while still achieving the same goal of uh, creating continuous flow paths throughout the surface. And um, the reason I think that uh, depression filling is the sort of go-to tool for most spatial hydrologists is because of its widespread availability in GIS like ArcGIS and because of its efficiency. It's a very fast technique. And so in particular, in recent years, I've been focused on trying to develop better and improved um, depression breaching methods that are as uh, efficient or at least similarly efficient to, to what uh, is achievable through depression filling solutions. So here I have the tools that are available in, in white box tools. So the one on the, on the right in particular, the breach depressions least cost tool. Uh, and we can see as it's being applied to a fairly large two gigabyte a digital elevation model with 500 million cells in it, um, that it takes about 35 seconds. And that's not far off of the time that it takes to fill this, again, using a fairly advanced technique that I developed and is available in white box tools, where we see it takes about 19 seconds or so. So, you know, yes, filling or depression breaching rather is a slightly slower solution, but ultimately I believe that the gains that you have in terms of the, the quality of the output um, and the, the uh, much uh, lower modification to the DEM makes this approach much more suitable. Moving on to the next problem that I identified of surface roughness. LiDAR DEMs, it's always uh, astonishing to me that you know, we pay tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars or even millions of dollars to acquire these um, very highly accurate, um, very precise elevation models. Um, and then as soon as we get them, one of the first things we do is visualize that data and are often confounded by the level of topographic variability that they display. So as I say, they contain often a great deal of roughness, surface roughness as we see here in the image on the far left. And that surface roughness truly reflects a combination obviously of, of error as there is in all DEMs, but also the fact that it's capturing small scale topographic features. You can see, for example, in the farmer's field that we have in the image on the left that we actually capture tillage patterns. It's entirely possible to see tillage patterns within the field. That's real topographic variability, but when it comes time to extracting variables like say slope, that's a level of topographic variability that we don't want. So the thing that often sort of frustrates me is to see people take this beautiful LIDAR DEM and then apply some sort of a smoothing algorithm that crassly removes that small scale topography in order to allow you know, enhanced measurement of things like slope. But in doing so, we also corrupt the, the quality data in it that we wanna preserve. In particular, you know, edge features like those associated with small scale drainage features. 
So if we apply, say, a mean DEM or a Gaussian DEM or a mean filter, rather, or a Gaussian filter, which are two common ways of smoothing uh, DEM data, then yes, we, we certainly can remove the small scale roughness that we don't want. But as you can see, based on the edges of this sort of central drainage feature um, that, that runs through the middle of this, of this DEM, uh, you know, we also blur those important edges. And that means that we are effectively reducing the information content um, of this valuable topographic data set. And so um, I've worked towards creating improved methods. And here I'm, I'm showing on the far right, the feature preserving DEM smoothing or FPS method, which I developed with one of my um, recent master's students, which is uh, an approach that uses effectively normal vector smoothing rather than elevation smoothing in order to, um, uh, to improve the, the smoothness, overall smoothness while retaining the crispness of edges. And this is a technique that was originally adopted by computer scientists for 3D mesh smoothing. Uh, and that I've adapted for, for use with LiDAR DEMs. Here's an example of that again. Uh, this is under fairly heavy force coverage, as you see on the left and on the right after applying the algorithm. And importantly, you can see that the edges associated with here, the, the terraces, the multiple terraces uh, of this river, incised river, are still just as crisp, even though we've reduced the roughness that uh, is fairly typical under heavy force cover. And lastly here, we have the uh, problem that I was presented with from one of my colleagues at Elmafra, the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs, uh, in which, you know, for uh, applying some of the recent LIDAR data that has been acquired for Ontario for soils mapping applications, as I mentioned, those road embankments are actually quite problematic. And so, uh, again, with a recent uh, graduated master's student of mine, Nigel Van Evenhausen, uh, we developed a technique to be able to try to remove or to, to uh, at least minimize the occurrence of these road embankments. This isn't something that you'd want to do in all applications. For example, in spatial hydrology, of course, those roadside ditches and the embankments themselves are actually quite important. But for certain applications, those embankments are very problematic. All right, the last aspect of my research that I'd wanted to talk to you about today is the development of uh, geomorphometric parameters. Uh, here again, I'm talking about novel land surface parameters or LSPs. So I've been developing novel land surface parameters really all the way back to my PhD in the early 2000s. Uh, an example uh, with the image on the right here, this is the probability of depressions, which has been uh, widely used and successfully applied for, for wetland mapping applications. But um, you know, the idea of creating novel ways of extracting information from these valuable DEMs that we've all been acquiring over the last 20 years is quite critical to me and of great interest in terms of uh, their applications for, for particularly environmental modeling. One of the more recent uh, LSPs that I've been working on and that I'm hoping to publish this summer, actually, when I'm on, finally on sabbatical, uh, my list of sabbatical uh, publication wishes <laughs> Uh, includes the, the impoundment size index. The impoundment size index is essentially a way of answering the question of how large of an impoundment would be created by inserting a dam of a particular size in terms of its length and height at any point within, a, uh, within the landscape. And in fact, at every point within the landscape. So the result is a map that tells you effectively if you could insert a dam at that site, how large would the upslope uh, flooded area be in terms of its flooded uh, area, its flooded mean depth, its maximum depth, and its volume. And this is an index that I'm fairly excited about because I can see that it has tremendous potential application areas in erosion and gully mapping, in wetland or um, WASCOB, which is a water and soil retention or control basin um, uh, construction siting applications, I, I believe that this, uh, that this particular index could be quite useful for informing uh, the, the siting of these features for conservation reasons. Here's an example of this. This is again based on some work that I'm doing with one of my current master's students at Birch Forging, in which we've applied the ISI, uh, and in particular the outputs of the flooded area and the, the mean and maximum flooded depth, in order to, um, to find sites where we could potentially on suitable uh, land that is agricultural and permeable soils, uh, stick an impoundment of at least one acre in size and uh, a maximum depth of uh, minimum maximum depth, I guess, 
of 0.75 meters. So we can show how we you could use this particular uh, index as a way of, of identifying um, uh, areas that could be targeted for conservation effectively. Another area that I've recently been quite interested in, in developing uh, novel uh, LSPs for is uh, insulation modeling and shadow, shadow modeling. Here, I'm interested in specifically the horizon angle. Uh, the horizon angle is, is the maximum view angle that's measured from a horizontal plane uh, in any one specific azimuth direction, azimuth uh, direction. And the horizon angle has actually been around for some time now as, a, as an LSP that can be extracted from a digital elevation model. And it's pretty widely applied in solar radiation modeling. The trouble with it is that it's very computationally intensive to, to calculate. And so in recent years, I've developed improved methods that can significantly improve the, the efficiency of the calculation of this particular index. And so when we combine a fine resolution LIDAR digital surface models or DSMs with this improved technique, then it opens the door for the creation of some novel and I think quite useful uh, land surface parameters related to, to surface illumination. So here again is on the left, an example of what horizon angle looks like. So in this particular case, this is the Guelph campus. My office is pretty central to this actually, it's pretty much in the middle. And um, this, is, this is taking a look at um, essentially what the horizon angle would be in a particular direction. So an azimuth of 110 degrees. Uh, on the right-hand side, what we see is what happens when we threshold the horizon angle for a particular sun position. So knowing that the sun is in, a particular direction, again, 110 degrees azimuth, and a uh, particular altitude above the horizon, then we can use the horizon angle effectively very easily just by thresholding, thresholding it to, um, to map the areas that are in full light and the areas that are in shadow. We can actually extend this. So because I'm able to measure these horizon angle rasters very, very efficiently, then I can actually compute them in a way where I can measure the, the create a, a shadow model for any instant in time. In fact, for all instances in time integrated over say an entire year or a, a block of months, whatever is of interest to you, say a season. And this can allow us to create a new LSP that I call time and daylight. Time and daylight effectively tells you the proportion of the time over which you've sampled this that a particular site is exposed to daylight where zero would mean that it's in full shade during the entire time, and one would mean that it's in full sun. And this is um, based effectively on, on, again, the combination of an efficient measurement of horizon angle combined with essentially a solar almanac that tells us where the sun is at any given time, all within the same tool within white box tools. And in my opinion, this um, novel LSP, which again, I haven't had a chance to publish, but it's on my wish list of things to accomplish during my sabbatical this summer and fall, but uh, I believe that it's certainly a better covariate um, related to insulation than say hillshade, traditional um, topographic hillshading would be for, for environmental modeling applications. In fact, we can see that even for visualization of um, you know, uh, highly, highly urbanized landscapes in particular where, where uh, the shadows cast by, by um, anthropogenic objects like buildings and trees and, and um, poles and whatnot, uh, using traditional hill shade, you end up with a very flat image by comparison to what we see on the, on the right here, which is time and daylight. So it's a much better method for visualizing um, um, topographic surfaces and in particular DSMs of, of urban areas can provide a much more realistic view of that. But the reality is it has Im uh, implications well beyond just visualization of topographic surfaces. So, for example, in speaking to um, some colleagues at NRCAN, <clears throat> one of their great interests in, in time and daylight was from the perspective of mapping the potential for rooftop solar panel installations across the city. And in particular, one of the characteristics of, of time and daylight is because you, you do give it a, sort of a period of time that you're interested in, or even a time of day that you're interested in, then it can allow us to better match for municipalities that are looking to incentivize homeowners to install these uh, features or, or even uh, energy utility companies to better match the installation or the targeting of, of um, incentives for homeowners to install solar panels on their, on their home roofs with the demands. So, you know, it's not enough to have a, a, a roof that is exposed to whatever the south 
what you really want to know, um, or at least what uh, um, uh, energy suppliers want to know is uh, where, you know, during the, the peak hours of demand, where can we uh, maximize our dollars in order to ensure that we're going to be able to, to level out that, that energy supply and energy demand. Oops. And another application of, of this uh, research that, that uh, again, I, I discovered in speaking to a colleague at, uh, here at Amafra is the fact that as uh, particularly in Ontario, as farmers have been adopting much better tillage practices like no-till, for example, then soil erosion rates have been reduced significantly. And many farmers have been contemplating the idea of removing the hedgerows that line their fields. Um, they have concerns largely, I guess, gather that the hedgerows uh, by casting shadows on their field are reducing the yield potential for their field themselves. And of course, this is of great concern to ecologists and, and people, conservationists who, who would rather these, um, these hedgerows stay in place. And uh, of course, they were initially planted for, to, to serve as windbreaks in order to reduce soil erosion when the soil is exposed in the springtime. So effectively, this uh, tool allows us to quantify um, exactly what the infield reduction of, of insulation and potential effect on yield would be for a particular site so that farmers can make a more um, uh, informed decision about whether or not to retain a particular hedgerow. The last thing I'd like to talk about today is um, some of the effort that we've, uh, in my research group, have been um, putting towards the development of multi-scale land surface parameters. In, in our field of geomorphometry, the scale dependency of topographic parameters like slope, aspect, and curvature has been a real challenge for environmental modeling. And while it's presented a challenge, it's also presented a fair bit of opportunity. And so many researchers have been exploring um, the utility of representing land surface parameters across a range of scales in order to improve their, their modeling. And here, I'd say the field that has adopted a multi-scaled approach to land surface parameters the most uh, it would be the predictive soil mapping group. Um, predictive, in, in the field of predictive soil mapping, the exploration of, of multi-scale representations of topography have been, have been quite um, critical. And they typically accomplish this effectively by measuring uh, parameters across different scales using varying um, filter window sizes effectively in order to produce what might be called a scale stack, which is essentially a scaled representation of the same land surface parameter over a range of, of potential scales. And they do this in order to then figure out which scales are best correlated with the thing that they're trying to predict, like for example, some property of soils. And, um, and so they statistically compare the, the stale, scale stack to then choose one or two homogeneous scales at which they represent those parameters that then move forward in the modeling process. And this is effectively what that looks like. If, if we take a look at this particular land surface parameter, which is actually deviation from mean elevation. Deviation from mean elevation is just as the name suggests, you're effectively transforming elevation into a local Z score, where you subtract the elevation from the mean elevation in the local neighborhood, and then divide that by the standard deviation to create a Z score. And deviation from mean elevation or DEV is effectively a measure of local topographic position. And if we consider a scale stack as I have here in this animation, you can notice that certain topographic features become bright, brightly colored at specific scales. And it shows effectively the range of scales at which the various features of this particular landscape are expressing themselves. And this actually goes back to about 2015 when I had a realization in, in, in starting to examine this research that, well, two realizations. The first one is that you know, effectively, we are taking this scale stack and trying to find a single or maybe two key uh, scales at which we're representing land surface parameters. But the challenge with that approach is that, um, uh, of course, a landscape is heterogeneous, made up of landforms of many different scales. And there probably isn't a single scale at which we can, we can measure that um, effectively. And that made me think of the idea of um, better characterizing land surface parameters in a way where we uh, uh, adjust the scale to the local setting surrounding every particular site. So for this, I took the deviation from mean elevation and I modified it so that for each grid cell, we're measuring the deviation from mean elevation at a scale or a neighborhood size 
that is unique to the characteristics of that particular site that maximizes its deviation, its um, uniqueness within the landscape. Deviation from mean elevation effectively measures how elevated or low lying a particular site is. So here I refer to R max as being effectively the scale, R is the filter radius scale, if you want to think of it that way, at which the deviation from mean elevation, the absolute value of it, is the, the maximum value. And that gives us our dev max, which is the, that actual maximum elevation. So dev max effectively measures the land or the local topographic position at a scale that that particular site, given its context, its topographic context, is most deviated from from its uh, from its uh, surrounding landscape. And importantly, this allows us to measure a different scale for every single grid cell in the digital elevation model. So the concept here is that we're taking a scale stack, just as we have in in normal multi-scale analysis. Uh, and, but we're measuring it in a much more dense fashion. So rather than having it coarsely measured across a range of scales, we measure every scale that you can across. And that comes to us from my other realization. The other realization was that there are more efficient ways to be able to measure topographic variables like this uh, that we can uh, derive from, from advances, recent advances in the field of computer science. In particular, in the case of DevMax, what I've used, utilized is uh, a um, image transform known as uh, the integral image transform and applied it to digital elevation models in order to allow me to very, very efficiently measure dev max, and therefore create a very dense scale stack. And then effectively to collapse that scale stack by measuring, again, for each pixel, the most deviated uh, value of div at, uh, at the most deviated scale and to create a, a single raster from that stack and that single raster effectively is a scale heterogeneous mosaic that's locally scale optimized. So this produces what I refer to as locally adaptive scale optimized local topographic position. And this is how they compare. So on the, on the uh, left-hand side, we have uh, you know, just a, a regular stack of, of div as we increase our scale size. And on the right-hand side, we have div max. And importantly, notice how as div max develops, we continue to represent each of these different topographic features, these landforms at the key scale uh, at which they're most expressed within the landscape. Here we have a drumlin field. Um, so this is near, near Peterborough, Ontario. And again, this is a DMAX image that allows us to, to really hone in on each of the individual features, even though they're all of varying scales in terms of their in terms of their spatial sizes in which they occupy within the landscape uh, and in my opinion this should allow us or my hypothesis is that this should allow us then to represent topographic variability uh, in a much more dense form in order to improve environmental modeling and in fact we've been exploring that hypothesis in my research group over the last several years so we've uh, applied this same idea that i've initially applied to to deviation from mean elevation to other land surface parameters. So it, most recently in 2019, we have um, applied the same technique to measure surface roughness. And then one of my uh, current PhD students is actually um, just in the, the process of finishing up his PhD. And he's been applying this same sort of technique, except instead of using the integral image approach, taking a fast approximate Gaussian approach in order to create a, a Gaussian scale space in which he then measures a whole range of common LSPs, including things like slope, aspect, and curvature. Again, the hypothesis then is that by doing this, we're able to represent topography and topographic variation in a much, a much more dense information um, manner that will then improve, improve analysis. And this has actually been something that we've just recently, and this is hot off the press, it, we're still in the process of, of finalizing this paper with the various co-authors, but we have applied this technique, therefore, to um, modeling soils properties, which we're hopefully soon going to be submitting this work. And this is sort of a preview of some of the things that, that we've identified in this work. So here, uh, Dan Newman has taken, um, I think, I think eight land surface parameters measured in this in this uh, particular fashion and um, measured various soil properties. So the soil properties are uh, chemical properties of cation exchange capacity, pH, and soil organic carbon, and texture properties. So these are 
to um, log ratio transformed um, uh, properties that represent effectively collectively the, the textures of, of sand, silk, and clay. And um, importantly, he's taken these scaled properties. So the blue line here, het C, represents the um, uh, locally adaptive scale optimized approaches to measuring, uh, I think it's about eight land surface parameters. And that's in comparison to chasing, um, uh, so, so taking a homogeneous scale parameters measured across a land, uh, a scale stack, and then choosing the statistically identified uh, best two predictors uh, using two different statistical approaches. So HOMO uh, T2 and homogeneous VIF. And we can see that for most, well, I think all, almost all of these, sorry, it's depth on the x-axis and the Lin's concordance correlation coefficient on the y-axis. So higher values means better predictive capacity. And in almost each of these cases, the heterogeneous method does in fact improve the predictive capacity of these random forest models. Uh, soil organic carbon, we just threw in there because this seems to be something that is of great interest to people at the moment. I've long been saying that topography doesn't predict soil organic carbon very well at all. And that certainly came to, to play here. And then lastly, not only does using this locally adaptive scale approach for measuring LSPs uh, improve the predictive capacity, but it also is demonstrated in almost each case, except for PhD, to have a lower uncertainty. So MPI is effectively a measure of the model uncertainty, so lower values are better. And I think we can see that in most cases, the heterogeneous approaches, in fact, do occupy the lowest uncertainty. Importantly, as well, this technique, keep in mind, is measuring topography at scales that are locally optimized based on the individual topographic settings, based on the information contained only in the DEM. And we're comparing that to techniques where we're literally correlating, which is the common approach these days, correlating the measurement of the variable at a particular scale to the outcome variable. So we're able to improve the predictive value without actually uh, resorting to this sort of data mining approach that unfortunately these days have, has become quite common. And then lastly, to summarize, so my research has focused largely on the utility of LIDAR derived DEMs for environmental modeling applications. And much of this work has certainly centered around the development of improved methods for preparing DEMs and also in the development and application of of uh, novel land surface parameters in order to better extract rich information from these DEM data sets for the purpose of, of eventual environmental modeling. Uh, obviously, my research is focused largely on the technical aspects of, of uh, you know, developing new techniques to better utilize this rather than the application side. But ultimately, in my opinion, it's very important for scientists like myself who focus on uh, technical developments to ensure that the methods that we develop can actually be used by practitioners. So for me, the development of open source GIS that people often sort of associate with, with my work uh, effectively is, is a, um, a platform for disseminating that, that research that is uh, the core of, of how I identify myself. So I will leave it there for now. Um, I'm sorry, I went a little bit over and uh, apologies for that. I won't lie, I thought the presentation was supposed to be 45 minutes <laughs> that's what I had prepared. And I, although I tried to, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, get it down much more than that. That was perfect, uh, John, it's, uh, <laughs> it's okay. It was so, uh, so interesting. And uh, I totally agree with you that uh, open source GIS is a, a fabulous way to uh, disseminate uh, our work. And uh, to put it in, uh, in, the, in the end of many practitioners, it, it provides very uh, uh, positive feedback and, and help us to, uh, to improve. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more with you on that. Yeah. It, it's, I think it's so important. And you know, as academics, we often focus on you know, the journal article outputs. Um, but, you know, equally important, if not more important, is, is the feedback that we get from the practitioners who are actually using the tools that we develop. And, and it provides a, a very good way to, uh, to initiate new research projects in collaboration with uh, many university. In the past, I've developed uh, many pieces of software, and it was the basis for, for collaboration with, uh, with colleagues in Europe. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so. Yes, indeed. Yeah. yeah. I mean, every day I'm emailed by, <laughs> by various white box users around the globe, um, and many times that does lead to, to very useful collaborations. Yeah. 
So uh, I'm pretty sure we have uh, some colleagues and students here uh, that have uh, used your software. And, uh, I'm pretty sure they have some questions for, for you. So, um, est-ce que vous avez des questions pour uh, John? N'hésitez pas à prendre la, la parole. So they are shy. <laughs> we'll ask one question. Uh, it's a pretty breakneck of... speed at which I covered stuff. So let's understand. <laughs> at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned the, the, the issue of the volume of data. Uh, we know that uh, LiDAR data could be very massive. So um, uh, with, uh, for example, white box tools, uh, you, you uh, you, you process a certain amount of tile, but some, some analysis we require to have, for example, uh, uh, the processing of a wall watershed or a very large scale. So uh, uh, how do you uh, envision <laughs> your, your, the, the, the connection between the, the processing capabilities, cloud computing and, and the massive amount of data that are more and more generated by the various sensors that, uh, <laughs> that we have uh, at end? I, I mean, it's such a good question. And it, it very much speaks to, um, you know, the challenge that, that I think practitioners are facing today working with these data sets. And, um, you, you know, I've, I've always had sort of a, a, a challenge with this. It's, it's the reason why, so white box GAT, I said was developed in, in Java and Java is widely recognized as being a very memory uh, intensive, uh, anything you write in Java, it's going to consume way more memory than it should. So, so one of the things I knew when I started the white box tools project was that I was going to select a language that was much more efficient in terms of its usage of memory than Java was. That helped me out tremendously. The other thing about Rust is that it um, allows me to write uh, parallelized algorithms much, much more effectively than I could ever in Java. So most of the white box tools tools that are capable of being parallelized, at least readily, have already been parallelized in order to make the processing of large amounts of data much more efficient. At the same time, um, you know, there are advances in, in the area of parallelizing these various algorithms using things like you know, GPU processing or cloud computing um, uh, or, or distributed computing rather. And um, uh, I have purposely developed white box tools not to assume that particular hardware is available. When I envision the typical user, I'm thinking about uh, you know, someone working for a conservation authority in a GIS office where they have a you know, seven-year-old desktop that's maybe not, not so fancy. And I want to be able to write the most efficient algorithm I can in order to allow them to be able to process the data sets that they have. Um, and that's, a, that's always a bit of a compromise. Uh, increasingly these days in terms of academics who are using massive, often global sized data sets, they're moving towards, as I say, cloud-based platforms where, you know, the, the many processors um, that are available, white box tools is allowed to consume. And um, so I've had, I've had reports of people using it on the cloud um, to do things like uh, some of this multi-scale analysis for the entire continent of Australia. And I remember um, this one guy who was working on this project in Australia saying to me that, you know, he set it up to run and then he went off to get a coffee thinking, okay, this is the rest of my day, basically. And when he came back, it was done. He was shocked. And again, it's because I've written it in a way to, to take advantage of all of the cores that are available in, in that environment. So, yeah, it's, it's a very important question. And um, it's something that is always at the tip of my mind in thinking about not only how to make a better algorithm or to make a tool that can allow you to extract information, but how to do it efficiently in a way where a practitioner can apply it to the types of data that, that they work with. Yeah, great. So, nouvelle question pour, uh, pour John. Ah, j'ai une main levée, Karim, vas-y. Yeah, uh, good morning and thank you for the for the presentation. Uh, it's wonderful. I've uh, I'm uh, a user of your uh, of your uh, application since a few months. I'm uh, using it with the, the project with the University of Quebec in, in Chicoutimi and the uh, uh, 
uh, geomatic center of uh, Quebec. And it's really wonderful. As we were saying just now, it's really quick. It's really uh, efficient. And, uh, I hope one day I'll be able to code things uh, that way. Uh, my question is, uh, actually, we're trying to use it. I'm using it to uh, categor categorize some plants. So I'm using it on DSMs and not DEMs, like uh, mm -hmm. you are talking. So uh, I, I, I just wanted to have your uh, 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 you're saying this. So, is it um, is it usable on on such a fine, like a finer uh, resolution of DEMs, or is it something that's more uh, efficient on like bigger D DEMs? Well, so it depends on. I mean, that's a difficult question to answer in truth because it depends on the specific application. So, um, you know, it depends on the, the various tools that you might well be using in your workflow to, to get to your end target in terms of uh, the, the limitations that there might be in terms of the, the size of data that you could apply it to. Uh, again, I've tried to create these tools as efficiently or to be as efficient as possible, but there are certain workflows that are just inherently very computationally intensive. Um, so for example, if you're working with LiDAR data, a ground point extraction, is something you might be doing. And that is something that is just not particularly efficient. You know, I'm constantly thinking about how to improve the efficiency of, of those algorithms and, and work strive towards doing so. But that is definitely a bottleneck in that in that computational workflow. Um, so you know, the I would say that the size of the data set that you can apply to, I always tell users, is dependent upon you know the capabilities of the machine that you're that you're applying them to and as well on the specifics of the, the workflow in terms of the, the tools that are used. So I don't know if I provided a satisfactory answer for you or not, Karim, but um, you know, I'm happy if you want to reach out to me and, and talk to me about the workflow that you're using to, to apply this, um, uh, to, to provide you know, perhaps a finer grain of, uh, of advice in terms of, in terms of how best to apply it. Yeah, thank you, we did. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. D'autres questions for... Uh... John, soyez pas timide. Charles, je te vois le micro ouvert. Tu as une question? Bah, bah vas-y, gâte-toi. Um, so I was uh, very impressed by the um, time and daylight that you showed, uh, especially in terms of modeling, for example, uh, urban heat islands or uh, phenomenons like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I had one question about it, uh, two questions actually. How computer intensive is it? And is there a way to include the city data like uh, city GML or uh, like building data that we may find on the web? Well, those are two good questions. So <clears throat> the first one, it, it is computationally intensive. There's no doubt about it. So, so compared to say, um, you know, I gave the example uh, for its utility for visualizing uh, surfaces uh, relative to hill shade. And hill shade is a simple three by three single pass over. It's easily parallelized. It's, it's something that, that um, can be calculated quite quickly. Time and daylight, however, obviously there's much more going on and it is parallelized. So it would strongly benefit from being um, computed on a, on a multiprocessor system or on a distributed system where it has uh, you know, many cores available. But I've been able to apply it on fairly fine resolution um, digital surface models, lighter DSMs, but one meter or so at the scale of the city of Guelph. Um, again, for, for like an entire year. And it takes, I, I forget now, but let's say of the order of about an hour, but it can, it can certainly compute it. Um, okay. uh, so, so, you know, that comes down to the fact that again, it's, it's heavily parallelized and I've, I've, um, developed a, a, a um, method of measuring horizon angle that's, that's, you know, it's got some tricks in it to make it a little bit faster effectively than, than what it would traditionally be in, in say other GIS. And that's kind of what I do. I'm constantly thinking about how to make these algorithms more efficient because efficiency often relates to innovation. You know, as is the example with the multi-scale work, it's not about just saying, okay, well, there's this method in computer science that's used to measure um, you know, uh, averages much more more quickly across an image. It's the fact that in doing so, we can then measure scale variables uh, much more densely and then derive more rich information that way. That's why I'm so focused on that. 
So I think I answered the question about the computational intensity of it. Uh, what was your second question? It was about the buildings. So um, it's basically the input for it is a DSM. So if you have a digital terrain model and you have a buildings model, simply adding the two together obviously will result in a DSM, a modified DSM. Uh, and and the technique would would apply to that equally as it would to a you know a, a lidar drive DSM. Um, uh, of course, there's there's no rules about what that needs to look like. You could take, for example, a DSM that includes buildings and not vegetation, um, or you know include vegetation and not buildings, or both. Uh, it just takes a it takes a digital surface model input effectively. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. On aurait le temps pour une dernière question pour, pour John. Est-ce qu'il y a quelqu'un qui se lance? Eric Gilbert, hein? pas de question pour John, t'es sûr? <rire> non? Euh, je, je peux? Oui, vas-y, vas-y. Je ne sais pas qui c'est, mais... Euh... Euh, je n'ai pas... Je n'ai pas vraiment euh, de questions, euh, si ce n'est que peut-être une petite demande. Euh, euh, comment accéder à, à vos travaux pour pouvoir euh, les, les explorer euh, en profondeur euh, je, je me présente, désolé, je me présente, c'est Junior Moukenze. Je suis euh, étudiant en master en Corée du Sud okay. euh, dans les technologies de convergence. Euh, euh, je, actuellement, je, en domaine de recherche euh, dans lequel j'évolue, euh, et précisément dans le GIS, où je suis en train de voir dans quelle mesure euh, je peux euh, analyser les phénomènes d'érosion euh, à partir des données GIS, effectivement, avec, en utilisant les algorithmes de l'intelligence artificielle comme les K-Means, d'abord pour les clustering, ensuite euh, euh, penser à une, à une prédiction. Alors, je suis en train d'explorer plusieurs techniques et je suis vraiment intéressé par ce qui, est, ce qui a été dit euh, okay. durant la session. Je, je vais, je vais tra tra traduire pour, pour John. So, uh, I, I translate what, what Juno said. <laughs> uh, he is a master student uh, dealing with um, uh, the study of uh, JS techniques for uh, different uh, application domain and mainly uh, dealing with uh, erosion. So, so uh, and it's very, ah, so, so. <laughs> very, very interested in your in your uh, in your software and what you have presented. So, uh, could you please remind us uh, the link to uh, your GitHub uh, pages and uh, uh, where you can find some documentation? I think you provide it at the beginning of the presentation. So, uh, that's right. I think right here, <laughs> and I'm happy to I'm happy to put that in the. Um, in the chat as well, if I can manage to do so. <laughs> but I'll tell you what. After afterwards, I can email it if you if you wish. Um, but effectively, I think if you, if you just Google white box and GitHub, it's the first link that pops up. And if you Google white box by itself or white box tools, then um, our webpage uh, www.whiteboxgeo.com is the first one to come up. And from there, it's pretty easy to navigate to where you where you download the software. Uh, and it's all, it's open source. Um, we have recently started a, a company. So about 10 months ago, months ago, we launched a company in order to help support as the scale of this project has, has become global. It's admittedly getting a little difficult for me. It is, it's just me and, and my grad students that, that manage this thing and it's getting a bit challenging. So we've launched a company and started to sell um, extensions. And so I say that uh, it's open source, all of the open core about, I think, uh, 460, 470 of the tools are are all within the the GitHub page, and then there's just a, a few that that um, that we've been selling as part of an extension to help support the, the further development of the project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Charles, te vois la main levée. Okay. Vas-y. <laughs> one last one last question. Um, I've noticed recently that. Uh, Whitebox was um, actually connected to Google Earth Engine 
by the GMAP uh, Python package. And does this new fact uh, encourage you to develop new tools or that may be applicable to, to the specific Google Earth Engine context? Oh, that's a good question as well. These have been wonderful questions. Um, <clears throat> so, so the front end, so, so I developed the back end of white box tools. The front ends are generally maintained by other, by other people. So my concern is in developing and fleshing out the various tools and then various other people. And in particular, uh, um, Sheng, this, this um, assistant professor in, in the States, he's the one who has created the ArcGIS front end and the, the, the Google Earth Engine, the, the GMAP front end that, that you're talking about. And admittedly, um, it's a little embarrassing to say, but I haven't used it that much. <laughs> I tend, I tend to, um, to work in, in sort of my domain. And so I haven't, I haven't had a lot of excuse to, to, to use the, the GMAP. In fact, one of the tragic truths about it is the, the uh, I had mentioned that, that um, there's also a front end for QGIS and that, that front end is actually maintained by uh, a guy in the Ukraine and unfortunately, I think last week or the week before that front end disappeared, it's um, no longer available from his web page, which is a little tragic. Um, we, we're, so we're aiming to, to get a solution out there that, that other QGIS users can 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 use. But uh, yeah, the front ends are are honestly things that that uh, you know when I stopped programming white box GAT, one of the reasons was because people were interested in the tools, and I was spending an awful lot of time creating a front end effectively. And um, front end coding is is a whole other beast. <laughs> it's, yes, it's, very it's not the most fun <laughs> to tell you the truth. <laughs> Doesn't matter where you put the button, someone's going to complain that you put. It there. <laughs> so so I let other people worry about the front ends, and I focus on developing the tools and algorithms in the back ends. Great. That's, that's a long answer to a short question. Totally fine. I understand. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm thrilled to know that people in the community have taken it up and, and have developed so many front ends in order to allow it to work in, in different environments, though particularly cloud-based environments, because I do see that as the future. Thank you. Perfect. So uh, it's time now to, uh, to thank you very much again, John, for, for uh, your presentation. It was a great webinar today. I think uh, a lot of people uh, are very happy of this uh, opportunity to, uh, to, to, to get more details about your work and, uh, and to exchange with you. So uh, thank you again very much. <laughs> it was a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you so much for the invite. I do really appreciate it. It was a great honor to be able to speak to you all today. <laughs> and we, we keep in touch uh, because uh, I, I see many opportunities to, to collaborate with, uh, with you. So uh, we will uh, we will talk to talk again uh, together uh, in, a, in a short period of time. <laughs> uh, I mentioned this earlier, but I'm always open to collaborations. So yeah. that sounds great. And Thank I will you. send the link as well. That, that if you wouldn't mind sending around to everyone for for the um, download. So. Great. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Welcome. Bye bye. All right. Okay. Nice to meet everyone. Take care. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>